Lord, and I'm on my way back. Don't you know that I'm down on my bed? Lord, I'm begging you to save this whole of my Lord, I'm begging you, please forgive me, Jesus. Lord, and try me. Son, Lord, and I'm on my way back. Don't you know that I'm down on my bed? Lord, I'm begging you to save this soul of my Lord. I'm begging you, please forgive me, Jesus. Lord, and try me one more. Well, when I win a strength from you, Jesus, Lord, I thought I You know, church, it's good to have a Savior, isn't it? Yeah, I know that's right. If it's good to have a Savior, you ought to be on your feet right now, church. Lord, and try me with and It's good to have a Savior, Lord, who forgives us of all of our sin. Lord, it's good to
Christ this morning. This is Homecoming Sunday, and we're proud you're here. Amen. I want to say to all you old timers that's been here for a long time, back there with me, back when we started, I want to tell you to just take a, a second and look around and see all the great things God has done. You see, when I walk up here this morning and look out across the crowd, I see things other people don't see. I look over here and I see James Buchanan sitting here and I remember back in the days when James was a child out in the province community one night throwing rocks at our buses. Yes, I remember that. I hear Tyree saying here tonight, any prodigals here, raise your hands and I'm thinking that's the young one that used to cuss me more than anybody except that little white boy come out of Vine Hill. I don't know what happened to him. Our God is a good God. Our God has changed people's lives. He's changed them with the blood of Jesus. That's right, brother. Daniel Gooch had got his baptism certificate this morning. Was just a mere kid that rode the bus over at Miss Mary's and got on a bus that I think it was Calhoun Street or somewhere he come off of. And he got on a bus with a little boy named Earl. Earl had just a tremendous personality. Earl's not with us anymore. Committed suicide over a girlfriend. You think about the pain that's happened in people's lives. What would have happened had we not been there? Not everybody's made the kind of decisions we want them to make, but we put them in God's hand and let God be the judge. We'll be the encouragement to them, okay? We shall not give up. When I look at people, and I've used his name several times, but when I look at William Brown and I see how God changed his life, I know that there's no reason for us to quit. Amen. Jesus got the power to change a sinner and bring him home, and that's what we're here for. Amen. I remember when Cynthia made the video and talking about the death of her son and talking about how the hoodlums on the street killed him and her, all of the group that he run with, and she said he killed them one by one. Satan is making an impact on our cities, making an impact on our communities. He's made an impact on our lives. But Jesus is the victory. Amen. Talked to one mother here this morning. It used to have got on the bus the first time, one was at Radnor, and she lived out in the Shelby Avenue, James Casey Holmes. Her daughter is a federal prosecutor now in Dallas, Texas. There are people here that's done great things in the name of God and live for Jesus, and we're thankful for them. We're thankful that we had a part in touching their lives and telling them that Jesus is Lord. I want us to challenge you this morning and I want you to look deep in your heart this morning and I want you to really push yourself this morning. As we are closed up with this verse last week and I want to open up with it this morning, Psalms 86. Now this is when King David is praying. This is King, part of King David's prayer. And I want you to look at your heart as we go through this. Psalms 86, verse 11, David says to God Almighty in a prayer, Lord, teach me your ways. Church, are we willing today? The question I want to put in front of you today as an individual, are you willing to say to God Almighty, teach me your ways? Are you willing? All those grandparents that stood up, and by the way, I appreciate that, Todd. I want all my grandkids to come by and tell me how much they love me today and don't ask me for a dollar. I want you to come by and tell me you care about me. Brown, I got so many of them, they break you when you come by. Just thank God the parents told them to ask for a dollar, not a five dollar bill. Bankrupt the county. Lord, teach me your ways. As parents and as grandparents, are we willing to instill the ways of God in our children's lives? That's a question that's before us today. Are we willing to instill the message of God in our own lives? Parents, your children are watching you. You can preach Jesus, you can read Bible, you can sing songs, you can act religious, but if you teach one way and live another way, the children see the division and they're going to follow Satan. You are responsible for training your children. The Bible tells us, train up a child in the way it should go. We love our children. We want what's best for our children. And the best thing for our children is for us to love them 
and train them. Love them enough to train them. Love them enough to warn them that Satan is out to destroy them. Our children watch our actions. We've got to teach our children our actions need to be actions of us loving other people. And church, what I'm saying is we need to stop pointing out bad in other people's lives. We need to stop trying to judge everybody on planet Earth because we are not smart enough to judge anybody else. You may think you are. I've got a news flash. You're not. You don't know why people do what they do. We need to be encouraging people. Our children need to hear us praying for people. And he goes on and he says, I will live and obey your truths. Are we willing to obey God's truths? Do we trust this morning? Does the inner city church of Christ, do the members of the inner city church of Christ, are the people that are sitting in this building on these pews this morning willing to trust God's instructions? When he says to forgive, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Are you willing to forgive those people? Cynthia, what he's saying to us that we have to be strong enough and trusting God enough that we allow God to judge those who murdered your sons and turn it over to God and let him take care of the judgment. It's not up for us. That's easy to say. Brother, that's hard to do. When somebody hurts your family so personally, when somebody violates your family in such an ungodly way, it's hard, but it's God's way. The greatest gift God has ever given us is grace. And we expect God to forgive us. We want God to extend to us his grace. We have to extend it to others. We must learn to deal with truth because God is truth. Jesus told Satan when Satan was tempting him, Jesus didn't do it. His, it didn't take off and try to do it Satan's way. Jesus told him and took a strong, bold stand. Told him, get behind me. Jesus took a strong stand. Church, listen to me. He took a strong stand for righteousness. We as people must learn to take a stand for righteousness because it is God's word. It is God's instructions. When he says to love your enemies, turn near the cheek, that is God's instruction. We are not to condemn them or to talk bad about them or say bad things about them because Jesus died for them. Now, you and I both know we wouldn't die for them. We are having a hard enough time getting along with them. And Jesus died for them. That shows how righteous Jesus is. But church, we have got to develop the attitude of David. Lord, teach me your ways, and I will live and obey your truths. And then he noticed what he says. And this is where it's going to come home. Help me make worshiping your name the most important thing in my life. The church this morning, we need to do some repenting. We need to do some changing, some attitudes. Some of us make decisions based on Satan's ungodly ignorance, and we make decisions on the wrong things. We use wrong value system. We use a street psychology. What somebody does something to you, I've got to get even with them. That's ungodly. Street philosophy is not God's philosophy. He said, help me. And this needs to be on our prayer list, church. We need this thing, we need this verse pinned on, glued to, taped, nailed <laughs> to our refrigerator door. We need to make worshiping God's name the most important thing in our lives. If worshiping God's name is the most important thing, Thing in our lives we won't be cursing his name we won't be using his name just like everybody else's name we'll watch what we say 
Oh, we're going to have some words sometime and we're going to start saying the wrong things. But when you start saying the wrong things, you realize you're saying the wrong things. I got a secret for you. What really works right then is just stop talking. Just don't say anything. I love the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, and all my soul. And you're walking away, and that guy's standing there blowing out all that ignorance, and you're thinking, thank God I'm not killing him right now. And you walk away, and you don't have to explain your patience and your righteousness. God understands. Worshiping God is important to God. Us worshiping him, that's important. You being here today, he is pleased with you being here today. You've made a great decision today. And as we worship together and lift up his name and we sing about the prodigal coming home and the robe and the crown, the angels in heaven are rejoicing because we are witnessing to the devil just how much we love the Lord. You think that don't upset Satan? You think that don't bother him? When we take a strong stand and we will follow Jesus and only Jesus and Jesus is the Son of God and He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. When we witness about that to Satan in our lives and when we take that witness into the workplace, we take that witness into the home, we take that witness into the streets, we love the Lord. It's important to the Lord. Worshiping the Lord is important to those that love the Lord. It's important to those leaders that worship the Lord. It was important to King David. It was so important to King David one day he was trying to find a place to worship the Lord to do his sacrifices and a man offered to give him a threshing floor to where he could do his sacrifices and David said, oh no, this is for God. I'll buy it. You can't give it to me. I'll buy it. It was important to him. And worship it is important to this church. I want you to train yourselves to come early. Be here and encourage one another because sometimes we come in here pretty beat up. Satan's tried to drag us down all week long. Some of us in here are involved in very unhealthy relationships. And we come in, we're just doing good to get here. And we need to have such a love feast going on when people get here. They want to get here early, early because they want to be here for that healing. It's not the mechanics of worship. It's the love that happens in the worship. We want you to be here in time to pray together with us. We want you to love his, meditate on his word. It's important our worship is to recognize the blood and the bread that represents the body of Christ that died for us. Let's just don't let that become haphazard in our life. But let's do it every Lord's Day and be here to give. We want the spirit David had. No, you're not going to give me a threshing floor. I'll buy it. Anything that dealt with God was important to him. Our assembly is not a time. Larry says that every time when he welcomes them, we don't need the text. I'm proud he says that. It's a time to turn off the telephones. It's a time to shut Satan's door. It's not a time to go walking out in the hallway like we're at the mall. It's a time to worship God Almighty. Now, I understand that we have some people here that struggle when it comes to staying still and sitting in one place and they're A, A B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, R, whatever. But they're good people. And we love them, but they need to be in this auditorium. So when you see one of them walking around out there, you say, hey, go back and sit down in the auditorium. And they'll say, okay, and they'll turn around and come back and sit down in the auditorium. I want them to be here. It's not a time to be talking unless your talk is about praising the Lord. And here is a tough one. It's not a time to daydream. We sit in here and we think about on the job, Think about the football game. Think about sports. Dave Edwards is over here. If he's here, he'd be grinning at me because he says Vanderbilt can lose a game quicker than anybody he's ever seen in his life. I'm a Vanderbilt fan. We had the game one the other night. Had one more minute to go. Can you believe it? We lost the game. 
with Jesus we don't lose. I've read the last page. We win. And church, we need to start living like we win. We need to stop winning. We need to stop living like we're a bunch of losers. We need to stop focusing on trying to draw attention to ourselves, making church more of a comedy act. It's not about us. It's about God Almighty. Worship's important to God. I was looking and I was studying for this lesson and I found this passage of scripture in Exodus and it's, I thought it quite interesting. I'd read it before, I'd heard it before, I'd probably heard sermons on it before, but it got me this time. And that's when God was talking to Moses when he was going down to uh, Egypt to free his people. And he said, when you go down there, Moses, and you're going to meet Pharaoh. And I want you to do all the miracles that I have told you to do. And then I'm going to harden old Pharaoh's heart. And he is not going to let them go. And knows what he says in verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel my fur is my firstborn son. God is telling Moses, he's looking at his nation as his firstborn son. You know, it's something about being the firstborn. The firstborn is special. My brother is the firstborn, I wasn't. My family tolerated me. They loved him. And they loved me. They didn't mistreat me. But there was something special about Larry being the firstborn. That's just the way God made us. All of us is not the firstborn. We're happy with it. It's okay for us because they expect more out of the firstborn. That was fine with me. Work his bottom off, not mine. That's good. Firstborn's are special. And God said, Israel is my firstborn. And then notice what he said. I want you to tell Pharaoh, and I am telling you to let my son go and worship me. That stands out. God wanted Israel to come out of Egypt, to come out of slavery, not to be free, to worship him. God wanted Israel to worship him. God wants his firstborn son to worship him. God wants you to worship him. When we wake up in the morning and on Sunday morning and we're feeling kind of draggy because we had a rough Saturday night, we need to be thinking about today's time to worship God. It's real homecoming. We have homecoming here every Sunday morning because we meet around the table of the Lord and we celebrate his victory. Yes, we've got to be people that trust God. See, we're having children that's been born in this world, been born in our city. A lady told me this week when she was abandoned by her parents and by her family as a little child, it makes it difficult for her to trust God. It makes her difficult to trust anybody. But we can still trust God because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've got to teach our children that. We've got to instill in our children so that everyone who believes in him will not be lost but have eternal life. We as parents have got to teach that into our children and we've got to teach in our children the character of Christ and the heart of Christ in verse 17. He said God sent his son into the world. He did not send him into the world to judge the world guilty but to save the world through him. God's in the soul saving business. He's trying to get sinners to come home. Devil has told some of us that we are so bad that God can't forgive us, that we are not worth anything. God loves you, and he created you in his image. Every time we extend the invitation song here, and it starts to, we start to sing, and you hear a voice in your head saying, not today, don't respond today. Let me ask you, have you ever been baptized into Christ? Jesus said, he that believes in his baptized shall be saved. You know what he meant by that? He that believes in his baptized shall be saved. He has that kind of authority and that kind of power. And that, that invitation is to you this morning. We're calling you this morning to walk away from a life of sin. And you say, well, I can't make it. I can't live a perfect life. But you can follow Jesus. And that's what it's about. It's about following Jesus. Allowing him to forgive your sins. 
allowing him to teach you how to talk, teach you how to forgive, and teach you how to trust. Jesus is our Savior. And Jesus is calling you this morning. He's calling you to come to him. And I hope this is your prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, as we stand before you today, we ask you to bless this church. Teach each one of us, Lord, your ways. Teach us to obey your truths. Help me this morning, Lord, and help everybody in this building to make worshiping your name the most important thing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Church, I hope this morning that you're ready to give your life to the Lord. We're going to go out here to the park, and we're going to have a great day, and we're going to have some good fellowship, and it's going to be fun. But we don't want to go out there with all that sin and all that guilt and all that disobedience. And this is not a time to start heading out of the building. You can turn around and sit back down. It's a time to come to Jesus. It's a time to come to Jesus. Our God has done his part. We're trying hard to do our part. Won't you let us help you do your part in following God's commands? Won't you give your life to Jesus right now while together we stand and sing? Won't you come?